Hi, everyone. Welcome to our second PPCR talk. Um, as you know, we have developed these Wednesday's conferences for you to get in touch with PPCR alumni and uh, where they can share their experience in PPCR and what were the next steps that they took, uh, even if you choose to, to follow the clinical path or if you choose to keep growing on clinical research or if you want to match both. Today, I have the honor to present Manuel Castillo. He's a PPCR alumni for, from 2014. He also was a TA for t two years. And now he's a postdoctoral research fellow here at Harvard um, in, in our hospitals in, the, uh, in Boston. And um, he did the MPH after PPCR. And we're really happy to have, her, to have him. Manuel, can you, I will stop sharing so you can start um, sharing. Uh, Hi everyone, thank you very much for joining us uh, in this talk. So I'm gonna share my screen now with all of you. So I prepared some slides for this talk. Okay, let's make this work. Okay, as Alma mentioned, uh, there are different pathways uh, that you can follow. You have the clinical, you have the research, and you can also merge both of them. Uh, I'm gonna tell you kind of like my story and the pathway that I follow after PPCR. So I have no disclosures. Uh, well, my name is Manuel. I'm a research fellow at the Division of Trauma, Burn, and Surgical Critical Care uh, at the Brigham and Women's Hospital here in Boston. I, I also have an appointment at the Center for Surgery and Public Health and Harvard Medical School. Now, how did I get here? So if I remember correctly, it was March 21st, 2014, where I started this journey. I finished medical school in Lima, Peru, and then I proceeded to travel to Boston. And I came here for two things. One, PPCR, and the second one to do a research fellow at the Beth Israel Deaconess Medical Center. Now, in 2014, uh, PPCR actually had a component that was called the Clinical Research Fellow Practice Program. And this was kind of like the clinical portion of the online research course that was uh, given by Felipe, and this has evolved throughout the years. Now it's called the International Research Initiative. So basically what this program does is they bring people from all around the world to do research uh, in labs in Harvard affiliated hospitals. Uh, it's still overseen by Felipe, and well, since I came in 2014 to, to current times, I'm actually part of the board and the admissions committee and I put the website there in case any of you have any interest in coming to do research here, to have like a more, a more hands-on experience and to apply all the knowledge. No, now, I came to Boston to do the PPCR course and this research fellowship. Now, my research fellowship was at BI, as I mentioned, at the Department of Surgery, and it was mostly focused on pancreatic cancer surgical outcomes, patient education, and uh, surgical education. And as you can see in the picture, you can see to my right, that's Dr. Tara Ken, that was my main PI. Then you see Dr. Amara Watkins, who was a resident at that time, and Dr. James Moser, who was my other PI. And as I mentioned, uh, it helped me actually apply at the same time I was learning PPCR, all the knowledge that I was learning. You know, I remember very clearly when I was a statistics module, which to be honest, at that time, I was very afraid of this module, but I learned to actually like statistics and to understand that this is the cornerstone of research. And you know, I apply all this knowledge in parallel as I was doing my research fellowship. So when I realized uh, once I finished PPCR is that yes, I got all this knowledge uh, and I wanted to do more research. So I started doing some investiga investigation and I, you know, I ended up going to the School of Public Health and having a meeting with Dr. Heather Bear, who is one of the uh, persons responsible for the MPH. And she told me about the Master of Public Health and how this program could actually strengthen my skills that I already learned with PPCR. Interestingly, I actually uh, got a meeting, an interview with Dr. Heather Bear. Um, I told him, told her what I came to do in Boston. 
she actually knows about PPCR. I told her that I was doing this course online under the, you know, under Felipe's uh, supervision and she knows the program. She is aware that many of uh, the most talented alumni from PPCR have applied to the MTH. And it's actually an advantage. Like she basically told me, you know, we know about this program, we know how hard you work. So please uh, be sure to apply. And then I was faced into the first, you know, the first decision. The Master of Public Health actually has several options. As you can see, these are the different tracks that are available, at least at the School of Public Health in Harvard. And you had the clinical effectiveness, epidemiology, global health, health and social behavior, health management, health policy, occupational and environmental health, and quantitative methods. So after um, a thorough research and a lot of thinking, I decided to do the clinical effectiveness one. Now, the MPH application process was definitely a roller coaster. It was, you know, I was doing the, the research fellowship at BI. And at the same time, I had to manage to get all of these requirements. So I'm gonna go through like a summary of the application process, which I think are some of the key things that I learned through this process. First, the personal statement. The personal statement has to be very strong. You have to show why do you wanna do the MPH? What's your main interest? And obviously you have to be honest. I, I actually find like most people find this funny, but like I apply to the MPH with a personal statement that started with that phrase, surgery is my passion. That's how it started. I was being honest. Uh, my whole statement was showing how my life has been uh, geared towards a career in surgery and how I was incorporating the knowledge I, got, I was gonna gain from the MPH towards that career. Then you have to obviously mention why should they choose you? What are your strengths? What can you bring? What can you contribute to the program? And finally, what you're planning to do with what you learn in that program. Now, obviously, you know, the GRE is important too, and you have to get a good score. Uh, in, for this, I only use a, the Kaplan textbook for this. And you know, as, as I always say, when people ask me about the GRE, if you were good in math in high school, you should be fine with the GRE. The letters of recommendations are very important. You have to avoid generic, generic letters. And the way to do that is to get letters from people who, you, who know you well, who can go past, you know, this is a great person, outstanding person, does work well. No, they have to uh, write a letter where they show what are your strengths, how they met you, how they have worked with you, obstacles that you've overcome, how the relationship with your PI has evolved, and you know, those things. Now, many people ask me, you know, the debate between asking a letter of recommendation from a high rank uh, doctor, for example, versus someone that's a junior faculty but knows me better. I always say it's always to get a, a letter from that junior faculty that knows you well and can definitely write a better letter than a person who, even though it's high rank, might not know you that well. And then your CV and resume has to definitely match the program you choose. Uh, this is what I've seen with most people who have applied to the MPH and they have not uh, gotten in. Uh, people, for example, who apply to health management or health policy, they don't have anything in their CV that justifies that selection. Like in my case, you know, I was doing a research online course. I was here in Boston for a research fellowship, basically doing health services research. So clinical effectiveness was the right match for me. And also it has to match your personal statement and the story that you're telling. Now, once you're admitted, take advantage of all the resources that the school has to offer. You know, first of all, what I did, I took the, the 45 credit MPH clinical effectiveness. I definitely took more credits than that. Uh, I took classes from health policy, took classes from health management. I did have to send a few emails to, to be able to do more classes than I was required. But I even did, for example, the public health leadership program. And this is like a picture of my cohort. Um, and then what I always say is learn, learn, learn. I mean, the school has so many resources and so many tools. You're here, use them all. 
try to maximize your time and try to use them all. And one of the most important things that I definitely learned at HSPH was the networking. You'll be surprised for, you know, you get admitted, you get into this class and the people are amazing. You know, most of my classes were Fulbright scholars or were Fulbright scholars at some point of their lives. They have worked with, you know, health ministries in their own countries. They have changed economies in some countries. So these people are amazing and you're going to learn more from them than from the actual faculty. And definitely it will mark future collaboration with different people. Now, I graduated from the Masters of Public Health uh, with strong quantitative skills. And one of the things that I actually pursue while I was at the MPH was qualitative skills. Uh, I realized that at that time, there was a huge gap in the surgical research literature, which most people didn't do qualitative research in surgery. So I saw that gap and I, tried to find all the qualitative classes in the MPH and took them all and that's how I got those skills. So what are the next steps for me? Thanks to having both quantitative and qualitative, I was uh, able to get an offer from the Center for Surgery and Public Health, uh, which is an initiative that combines efforts from Brigham and Women's Hospital, Harvard Medical School and the Harvard School of Public Health. And I was able to work within this Center for Surgery and Public Health or CSPH, and I was given a position at the trauma division. And as you can see, I am the research fellow for all these people. So I definitely have work, a lot of work. Uh, but I was lucky enough to find this spot where these people are leaders in their fields in the US. You have, and I do different research with each one. So my main boss, the one at the top is Dr. Alex Salim. He's the chief of the division of trauma at Brianna Women's Hospital. And most of my research is focused with him on trauma system. Dr. Sarah Cooper, who is focused strongly on geriatric trauma. He, she has spearheaded uh, all the efforts of ACS uh, implementing geriatric trauma guidelines in surgery. And she's currently actually the director of CSPH. Uh, Dr. Adil Haider, who was the director when I was hired, and he is actually the one who found me and offered me the job, and I helped him with cultural dexterity for surgical residents. He's actually now the dean of the School of Medicine in Aga Khan University in Pakistan. Then you have one of the junior faculties, Dr. Kubeshak. Uh, I do burn care and disparity. Dr. Askari, I do necrotizing soft tissue infection research and all related to surgical infections. Uh, this is Dr. Joel Adler. Uh, he's a transplant surgeon, so it's a little bit different from uh, the trauma division. However, we uh, applied for a grant for the American Society of Transplant Surgery, and we actually won uh, a, a grant focusing on uh, developing a, a score to assess organ donation performance in hospitals with a focus on the New England donor services that actually that, actually that grant started today. So we're excited about that. Then you have Dr. Stephanie Nischke with whom I do trauma disparities and who was just named the program director of the general surgery residency at Brigham. Uh, Dr. Erica Rangel who I, whom I do surgical education with. Most of my work with her has been on maternity and paternity leave for surgical residents and how to improve uh, these aspects of life. Then you have Dr. Molly Jarman, who, with whom I do geographic disparities, and Dr. Joaquin Havens, with whom I do emergency general surgery. And as you can do, I consider myself very lucky to have ended in a place with so many PIs. Most people tell me, Manuel, you're crazy because you know the system is usually one research fellow and one PI. I have all of them. But that has uh, allowed me to actually be exposed to different types of research to uh, apply all my quantitative and qualitative knowledge and to definitely be efficient and productive. So, you know, my motto is always be productive, work, work, work. People who know me, uh, they can see me always working, always, you know, either, either preparing an abstract, preparing a manuscript. Uh, I, I've, I've been lucky enough to have more than 30 podium presentations with this division, more than 35 publications. And this is actually a map of the US where you can see all the spots I've been 
um, sent by the Brigham uh, for conferences. So basically that's, that's kind of like a review of my research career. Uh, if you have any questions or if you wanna follow me also on Twitter, that's my handle. And um, please let me know if you have any questions. Great, Manuel, thank you for your presentation. Uh, we have some questions, for example, Lumila is asking if she can apply to be a research fellow being a nutritionist because she's not, she doesn't have a medical degree. But I believe that Irie can help in that, right? At yes, so we've definitely had some uh, people who do not have an MD background that have been accepted. Um, it's not that, there's not that many people that have been accepted with, uh, without an MD background. But if we definitely see that this is a strong candidate and they have a strong application and you see the motivation, we can definitely, and this has happened before, because at Erie, we have you know, certain labs that we had people who come with different specialties uh, for we, which we don't have labs. And we have found labs for these people because we saw their motivation, we saw how strong their applications were, and we definitely found labs for them. So it definitely is possible. Great, right, thank you. And then Garki is asking, where are the difference between the many type of MPH um, that uh, Harvard offered? So each of them actually have their own curriculum and core requirements in terms of classes. Like for example, you know, health management is gonna have things that uh, teach you more about economics, about um, you know, negotiation, whereas health policy will, will teach you how to write uh, policy, you know, papers, uh, and how to, for example, add, uh, get into interactions with representatives, government representatives. So each actually track has, has its own core requirements. It doesn't stop you from actually going to classes from different tracks, uh, but yes, it, it has their own core requirements, their own set of evaluations, their own set of mentors. For example, I remember that I actually wanted Dr. Atulga wanted to be my mentor at the MPH, but he's only a mentor in the health management track. So I couldn't get him. So for example, that's an example of how the faculty may vary, but I definitely met him. I had lunch with him and we had classes with him. So, so there are differences, uh, but again, my main thing is like, yes, health, to me, for example, health management was very interesting. And I definitely took most of the classes, even though I was clinical effectiveness, but my CV and my life story didn't match health management, like didn't match any of the requirements. So if I had applied to health management, I would definitely have not been able to, to get in. So, you know, first of, first of things, see what your CV says, see what your story says, and then find the right track. But even if you like policy, health management, you like global health, you can definitely take their classes. Great, and then uh, other question is, what, are, what were your main challenges during the fellowship? Uh, so the first, uh, just to make sure if they're talking about the first BI fellowship or the second one, because these are completely different scenarios. If you can explain both, will be great. Perfect, so uh, one of the things is I did PPCR in parallel with the fellowship, and that was actually, uh, like I was, first of all, I was the first fellow of my PI. So I basically started the lab from the ground. So that was definitely very difficult because I had to learn about the IRB, uh, which is the ethics committee of the hospital, how to submit um, uh, a project for them to accept it. And, you know, learning the stats at the same way, at the same time that I was trying to build research, research projects. So that was difficult. That, demanded me to spend an entire summer just sitting in my desk and just, you know, learning what Felipe told me about stats and learning how to use data. And that definitely gave me an advantage in terms of the MPH. When I started at the MPH, I saw people that were completely lost in terms of stats, and I had a very, very solid base thanks to PPCR. And that definitely helped me understand, understand concepts better. It helped me move faster in terms of the MPH. So I think that was my main struggle. Uh, and definitely, obviously, um, adjusting to a new town, you know, adjusting to Boston, coming from Peru. And then for the, my second research fellowship, which was after the MPH, I feel it was more dealing with a change in culture. Different hospitals have different cultures, but at least in terms of knowledge, I was pretty okay. I 
by the time I finished the MPH, I could do, you know, thanks to PPCR2, I could do a project from the start to the end. You know, I can come up with an idea, build a proposal, present it to my PI, collect the data, analyze the data, prepare the, the abstract, present it in a conference, and write the manuscript. Uh, so definitely for my second fellowship at the Brigham, my main obstacle was time management because, you know, I was new. I didn't say no to anyone. So I was answering to more than eight people who wanted me to work on their projects. So that was my main obstacle. But, you know, I just didn't sleep. Not that I recommend it, but I just worked very hard. Grace, other question was if you got a scholarship for the MPH. So I, so you can apply for different scholarships. Unfortunately for Peru at that time, there was no scholarship. Uh, but one, uh, there are many options, you know, it depends on where you're from. Some, con I know, for example, some countries have different, um, different scholarships and they do have financial aid too. Uh, you can apply for financial aid. They have scholarships at the level of the School of Public Health. They have scholarships at the level of Harvard University. And worst case scenario, you can always get a loan from the Harvard Credit Union. So there are many options you can, you can use. And also the Fulbright. Uh, uh, yeah, and also the Fulbright. The Fulbright. Well, in my case, I, I did apply to the Fulbright. I was told I was going to get it only if I, had, if I was going to be able to return to Peru after the MPH. And since that didn't match my plans, I didn't take it. OK. And then another question, um, if they're saying that they're inter they have interest in anesthesia, but uh, that meant there are labs for anesthesia. You don't have to keep saying if he should go to the Department of Surgery. But yes, there are labs for anesthesia research. So yes, for sure. We've had some people uh, do anesthesia research. So as you can say, you feel, uh, feel free to actually go to, and I'm going to put this again, just so you guys, in case some anyone didn't see this. We have a website here. So this is the website. And uh, you can go there. We have a list of labs. And if you, for example, are interested in a specialty that doesn't have a lab, list, a lab listed in the uh, website, you can still apply. And again, if you're a strong candidate and you have the motivation and you do amazing interviews with us, we will make everything in our power to find you a lab. And we've had this, this before, you know, we started as, you know, an ortho surgery lab and a few, and one or two surgery, surgery research lab. And now we have, in a lot of specialties, we have, you know, general surgery, HPV, colorectal, endocrine surgery. So it, again, it depends on your application. But yes, we can do, we, we have people with, that does anesthesia, yes. Oh, great. And then Leticia is asking if she can do the residency and the MPH at the same time. Do you think that that is possible? Uh, it depends. It depends where you're doing the residency. If you're doing the residency in the US, that's a no because no program will allow you to do that. Uh, there are some um, programs, for example, I don't know if, uh, what specialty she wants to do, but some programs like surgery have uh, encourage people to do research years between second and uh, after second or third clinical year and you can definitely do your MPH in those years uh, but I don't think any program would allow to do it at the same time I know the Brigham internal medicine has some some sort of variant of the internal medicine program called demi demi doc which encourages that uh, but yes, it's, it's very dependent on the hospital, on the program, and on the specialty. Now, if you're doing a residency in your country, it depends on your country. I know, you know, if I would be doing residency in Peru, it would be difficult, but the School of Public Health has definitely options like the summer only uh, MPH, which will be a good option in that case. Okay, thank you. And then Paz is asking that she would like to do pathology. I believe that as a research fellow, Paz. Um, or, or is there any way that you can find like a hematopathology lab uh, for we that? We do have uh, an, a hemong lab. I, I think we do have also a pathology lab. So yes, we do have that. I think it's two separate labs, uh, but yes, we, we have them. Great. And then uh, Stefania is saying that um, how to 
um, strain the CV on, or what do you suggest? So uh, for the MPH or for the research? Or for the MPH. So I think, you know, you have to, um, it's, it's different. I feel, I feel everyone has different strengths in terms of the application. I feel that just by doing PPCR does definitely strengthen your CV. Your CV. And if you did an amazing job uh, as a student in, in PPCR, uh, we have different alumni that have been accepted into the MPH. And if you get, you know, you do well, at least I know the MPH Clinical Effectiveness Committee knows about PPCR. They know pretty, they know Felipe pretty well. And if you did a great job, definitely that that's a way to strengthen your CV. And then, for example, I mean, I can tell you that I've been doing research since I was in medical school. Uh, I won my first grant when I was in third year of medical school. Uh, so I definitely told this in my personal statement and in my CV, how research has always been in my life since I was a medical student and how I was always planning to incorporate it in my academic career. So, and if you don't have that, if you already are past medical school, definitely, you know, you have the research project at PPCR. If that gets published somehow, uh, you can definitely uh, do collaborations, but any publication definitely helps. But I think it's just, they have to see your motivation to do it. And great scores in the GRE and great letters of recommendation. Mm -hmm. Great, and then another question from Damian is if there is scholarship or any type of funding for the IRE? No, unfortunately we haven't reached that point. Uh, we definitely that's in our plan but there is no scholarship for ERI, yes. And then uh, a question for Felipe Cruz, um, if you can do, you can give example of the strength of the clinical effectiveness program, why do you choose that this type of MPH? So uh, the MPH clinical effectiveness is, mo is mostly geared towards people who are already either residents or faculty in, um, in the Boston area. So, in my case, I was already doing a research fellowship with Dr. Ken at BI. So I was a full-time researcher already. And this program actually matched my needs. You know, this was a combination of epidemiology and biostatistics that allowed me, and this, this program was focused on basically teaching a doctor how to do research. So this, and, and to apply those concepts in parallel to what you're doing. And definitely the networking. Like I managed to do, to go into classes with surgery people from MGH, surgery people from the Brigham who are the other two Harvard affiliated hospitals when I was at BI and get to know them, uh, get to do projects with them, have publications with them and increase my network. So I definitely made the right decision and it accommodated. They knew people were doing research in their labs. They knew people were doing, you know, other types of jobs. So it accommodated that. That's why I chose that MPH. Great. And then uh, Augusto is asking, um, what about the MPH in epidemiology? How did that differ? So the main, the main difference is that the core courses that you have to, to take, the core requirements are different. Definitely in clinical effectiveness, I had to take AP201. AP that was it. But if you definitely uh, do the MPH in epidemiology, you have to take AP 201, 202, and then the following advanced uh, classes. So that was the main difference. But besides that, I've seen multiple people who did the MPH in epidemiology and we shared most of the classes. So, I mean, yeah, it's, it's definitely still valid. Uh, we have one resident at the Brigham right now who's doing actually a PhD in epidemiology and in, he's still doing research with us, so it works. It also works. Great. And then uh, other question from Leticia, if you believe that you should do the MPH before the residency and how do you think that research impacted uh, or can impact a residency application? So that's actually a great question. Uh, it depends on the specialty. Like in my case, uh, you know, my area is surgery and, and having an MPH before applying to residency in surgery doesn't help you that much. And I knew this when I was applying to the MPH, but I didn't do it for the residency. I did it because I really like research and I really wanted to expand my knowledge from PPCR. 
But that being said, in my opinion, it helps a little because even if you, like I'm a foreign medical graduate, if you compare me with someone that's applying without research to surgery versus me with an MPH and more than 30, you know, publications, and I go to my interview with the program director and I say, hey, as soon as you, as I enter this, I'm going to start producing manuscripts, sending abstract to conferences, and depending on the program, if this is an academic surgery program, they like that. So again, it depends on the specialty. You know, some people who have applied to internal medicine without the MPH, they did amazing. Like, and I'm talking about the people who uh, went from Erie. Uh, people who have applied to neurology, internal medicine, without any type of MPH, and they did amazing. They match at Yale, they match at UT Southwestern, very good places. People without, with MPH have matched too. So, I mean, it, it, I think it depends on the person and how you portray yourself and how you get the MPH. In my opinion, it helps, but some people think it, it doesn't affect anything, and there's definitely... If you do internal medicine and you do, for example, cardio or GI fellowship, there are some programs that offer you the MPH as part of the fellowship. So at least it won't cost it won't cost you. But you know there are many options. Great, thank you for that. And then we have another question from Michelle Manan. She is at TA one, and she's asking, um, as a surgeon and a researcher, what are the next steps in your career? Do you plan to go back to the surgical practice? Or proceed as a full-time researcher. Are you hired by the Brigham, or you, or your income fully depends on grants? Thanks. That's that's a great question. It's a, it's a great multiple questions. <laughs> uh, so yes, uh, I'm evaluating going back to surgical practice for sure. I really miss the OR. So I think so far, being July first, two thousand twenty, I can tell you that I my plan is to go back to clinical. Uh, but definitely keep uh, the research as part of it. Now, currently I'm fully hired by the Brigham. My income does not depend on grants, but uh, yes, I have to acknowledge that moving on in the future, if I do stay as a full-time researcher, at least what the Brigham does is they will sponsor you for three years. As they will cover your salary for three years but you have those three years to get a KO, a KE grant, which is a government grant, which is a kind of like a research advancement grant, a career advancement grant. And you have three years to apply for that and to get it, and that will cover part of your salary. But if you go into practice, into clinical practice, you have to negotiate that with the hospital in terms of how much protected time do you get for research. Usually it's between 15 to 20%, but it depends on your negotiation with the hospital. Mm -hmm. So great. Yes, there are many options on how to do that. Yeah, and, definitely many options. And then Raquel is asking, uh, I'm, in, I'm an internal medicine physician here in Brazil, and I was checking on the IRI website. There are different fields in internal medicine. How do you suggest me to apply? In my CV, so, most of my, my experience is emergency care and infectious diseases. So uh, in terms of, you know, Erie right now, for example, like I, I think like the main disclosure right now, and you can see this in the website, usually around this time, we will be conducting the application season, the application season right now. We will be receiving applications and scheduling the interviews for uh, late July and August, but you know, COVID-19 has happened and we had issues bringing people, even the people who were supposed to come this year, most of them have not been able to come because you know there are no visas being issued, and you know the hospital doesn't want anyone to come. At least, for example, at the Brigham, there is a higher freeze. I know, and most of the hospitals are asking people from research working that to work from home. I've been working from home since March 14, and I'm supposed to to keep working from home until September. So you know, though this situation has definitely put a huge obstacle on the program. And we have stopped the application process or we didn't have the application process at all until we further know what's gonna happen. Now, that being said, uh, you, you can definitely apply, apply to, to Erie. And there, I know you have experience in emergency care and infectious diseases, uh, but again, if your application is strong and you tell us what are your options in terms of labs, you can def we can definitely find a lab for you. I mean. 
that's how the program actually has grown. We started with like five labs and now we have more than 10 labs. And it was basically, we had amazing applicants and we didn't want to leave them, you know, in the air. So we we'll definitely work hard to get them a lab. Great, Ray. I remember that, and I also asked you for help last year for for a, for a student, and thank you for that, for looking yes. the lab. And then oh, yeah. uh, Alma, Alma, remember, guys, Alma send always sends me the best people of <laughs> PBCR. Uh, actually, and, and I have to say this: one of your TA ones, I think he's a TA one, John Polanco. He's a TA one. TA two. He's a TA two. Sorry, I don't know if you guys know him. He actually did PPCR. He came to Boston for the workshop, and uh, Alma recommended him to me. He met with me, and now he's working at uh, the lab work because I'm still in charge of um, checking who gets into the lab for Dr. Ken at BI because I still keep my relationship with that lab. And John has been amazing in that lab. So I take Alma's recommendations very seriously. Oh, thank you for that. Uh, and then we have a question from Pablo Cortez. He's asking if there is a way to do the IRI and the APH at the same time. Uh, there is definitely a way. Uh, as long as you disclose that, we had uh, one student that did the program and when he interviewed for us for ERI, um, he was actually applying for the MPH, Daniel Mota, that's, uh, that's the student. And he did both of them and he never missed one of, because we do have at ERI, uh, a schedule of academic talks. Even I have, even I give some talks there about writing a manuscript or writing an abstract. So we do have, uh, we try to make this program as academic as possible. He never missed any of those talks. So he managed to do that. And it was kind of like good because when you do the MPH, at least the clinical effectiveness one, you require a practicum, which is basically, uh, you have to work with a doctor on a research project that you're gonna present as your thesis to graduate from the MPH. So he had already had a lab through the ERI program. So he just merged those, those two things. So it's definitely possible. And as long as you still go to the academic activities that the program offers, we're all good. Great, thank you for that. And then we have another question from Karen. She's asking if you have a lab in social behavior or that can investigate behavioral intervention like meditation or the use of arts for different pathologies? We currently don't have any lab in that area, but uh, we definitely could check. Uh, when, if you apply, we definitely can check and, and see if they're taking any, any people. But again, for new labs, that's how we have started. We always get a person requesting a new specialty and we're trying to find a lab. And you know, we, we do our best. It's, we don't have a 100% successful rate because you know it depends more of the pi and if the faculty wants a person but we definitely try our best but currently we do not have any social behavior labs great thank you for that and then pass is asking does bpcr makes my cv better to apply to erie what else should i do yes so you know the the thing at erie actually is we we say that we actually don't need you to come with like 10 publications. Does it help? Yes. But the, the purpose of the program is to teach you how to do research. So we had people that have been accepted with serial publications, but they, you know, they've, do, they've done PPCR, they, they seem highly motivated. And I think what we're looking for is people who have things clear. That, and they can, they, they're well motivated and they can, you know, portray that in their interviews. You know, we've had, we, you know, we all interview people you know, we have more than 50 applicants every year. I have been to all of those interviews and it's very clear to know who is, you know, who is really interested in the program and who just wants to come to Boston for social life. So you, we, we, can, we can differentiate those people from interviews. Now, in terms of the CV, you don't need publications. If you do have publications, yes, for sure that helps. Doing PPCR definitely helps because you're going to arrive here with an extra base, with a solid base on how to do research. Uh, but definitely we had people that have done PPCR and ERI at the same time, which was my case, for example. Uh, it's more difficult because I didn't have the solid base, but I made it through by just sitting down an entire summer and learning statistics. Great. Thank you, yes. Uh, I, I, I totally agree. PPCR will give you a great base and uh, 
it will be uh, easier for you to jump in the labs uh, meetings and, uh, and get to work with all the team. And, and the one thing I can tell you is learn statistics. Yeah. Most people here like us because most people here don't know statistics. And if you do know statistics, you're gonna have your own projects. People will look for you and ask you to help. And then you end up being co-author in so many papers. You know, that's how I've been actually have many publications. I, you know, I'm in a publication at Boston Children's because I help a random resident how to do stats that I met in a, in, a, in a social activity at the MPH. So PPCR does a great job giving you uh, the basis of statistics. And if you just put your skills to that, that will definitely help. Yes, completely agree. And then Inara is asking if you have labs in neuroimmunology. We have neurology labs. Uh, we don't have specifically neuroimmunology, but we definitely can look. You know, again, anyone who, which has specialty that doesn't show up in the website is welcome to apply and we'll, be, we'll make our, our greatest effort to actually accommodate. Okay, great. And then Garg is asking, if I do on campus an on-campus program, I'm afraid to stay away from the hospital because I think that uh, it might hurt my chances on matching in pediatrics. I am um, IMG, yes, she's from India. She's a great student from India this year. Okay. Uh, should I offer the MPH epidemiology online? I'm confused between the MPH epi online and the clinical effectiveness. So the clinical effectiveness is a unique program in the sense that it starts with a summer program, which is the, the, the PCE, the program in clinical effectiveness. And it's, it's a full on, program in the summer that you are basically having classes from 8 a.m. to 5 p.m. Monday to Friday, many classes, many home, a lot of homework. So I think that's the main difference. Um, the EPI online, well, as it says, it's just, you know, attending classes through, through you know, the platform that uh, HSPH provides. Uh, so I don't like, I think if you want to stay in the hospital in your country, Definitely online is an option. I have a friend who did the same. He was doing research in the Netherlands and in the MPH Epi online because he didn't want to come to the US because he wanted to stay in the Netherlands and do work there. Now, in terms of staying away from the hospital because it will hurt your chances of matching, it, that's, that's very specific in terms of each case. Like, are you applying to pediatrics soon? Like, are you in med school now and you want to just apply while being in med school? Or are you, I, I don't understand what's your, your specific situation. So I would need a little more, you know, a little more details on the situation to be able to give you an advice. But, you know, Sorry, if you're yeah. applying for pediatrics. He's right? applying next year. Sorry. So you're applying this September or next September? Okay, are you in the match right now or in do you okay next one so next september so so and what are you doing right now she's in india um right now. Like, what, like are you in medical school are you working as a he's up uh i believe she's up a uh, government service in pediatrics okay so she's like doing residency there um compository it might be like social service for us oh, right? social service okay okay so you're doing social service uh and what would you do between social service and applying? Because you're going to have a gap. So, so actually, my social service ends on um, 10th of May, 2021. Uh, okay, so, so you'll be like, a, okay, okay. So you, you basically are jumping from social service to residency right away. Yes, absolutely. Well, in that case, I mean, an online program would definitely be the best situation for you because if you want to do an on-campus program, you'll have to delay your residency application. Now, in your case, it sometimes it helps. If you have good um, step scores and everything, it helps that you apply without that gap. But I've seen people matching great programs with a gap, like... One of my best friends in Boston matched into um, 
at Boston Children's Hospital, which you know is the best pediatric program in the US. And she, she had a year between finishing med school and, um, and applying to residency and she managed to match. So I think at least in pediatrics, it doesn't hurt that much. Uh, but yes, you know, it, it depends on the specialty. Yes, and uh, yes. also in Texas, children they they, they is the second one, and they also get there and uh, directly. But that depends a lot also on your scores. Yeah, it depends on many things. I yeah. think if you have great step scores, if you have a strong application, I mean, a year out of clinic practice is not going to hurt you. Uh, and most people take that year out of clinic to actually study for steps, do research, and then they apply. So, I mean, it, there are many options. I cannot tell you that doing the MPH will definitely secure your spot in Boston Children's versus a community program in the middle of the Bronx, uh, because it depends on your specific situation. I've had cases, you know, uh, people who came to Erie and match, you know, which one? So the last one for pediatrics match at Gainesville, in Gainesville, and she, she did an amazing job. She has a strong application. She matched in a good program. And there's people who have managed in the National Pediatrics Program in Washington. So again, it depends on each person. But one year away from, from, I don't think one year away from the hospital harms you per se. Mm -hmm. Other TAs had mentioned that when, when they were TAs, I helped them and they were asked by the program director about being a teaching assistant in the program, what they do. So that's another thing. If you cannot come or do, or do an MPH or, or any other grad program, maybe at least um, to improve your CV, you can do that. And then uh, other question from Wilson Fandino. He's an, an amazing TA here in the program. And right now he's based in London and he's asking you, do you know how long in advance do I need to apply for the MPH? Um, okay. I'm sure we'll get okay. it, so. so it varies. It varies about, uh, because it depends on your whole process. If I remember my timeline correctly, uh, I started, uh, so I met with Heather Burr in September 2014. Uh, my application was due December 15, December 15, 2014. Uh, so I started the whole process late September. Uh, I was a little bit late to the process. I know most people who apply to the MPH to start the application process a year before uh, in terms of preparation. In my case, I rushed through it because I started very late. I Took, you know, I was already in Boston, so my English was good. So the TOEFL was not issue, was not an issue. Letters of recommendation I got one from Felipe, one from Dr. Ken, and one from Dr. Moser, who were my PIs uh, in BI. So that definitely helped. So that was fast. Uh, I definitely was rushing a lot because then you have to get your grades. At least my grades from medical school in Peru had to be, you know, screened and approved by World Education Services, and that took at least like a month, two months. So, and then, you know, taking the GRE, which depends on, you know, many people. I know people who have studied a year, six months. I was very busy in the research fellowship and I didn't have that much time. So I decided for a week. Uh, I don't recommend this, but I, you know, I, I just, I, I, my application was a bit rushed because I found out very late. But, you know, if you have the option to start your application from one year before, definitely that would be the best. Uh, and, you know, try to think about how, you know, tell the story of your CV. If you have, you know, put PCR, do a great job there, uh, for, you know, and try to get some, some publications, definitely I would help. But again, depends on which track you choose. Great. Thank you, Manuel. And then we've got another question. Is there a chance um, of working as a research fellow, like a paid position? After, and after a year, apply to the MPH? Uh, 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 is this from Ju Julia? No, this is Damien. Uh, okay. Oh, okay. I was, I was reading. I was reading Julia the Conti's question. Sorry. I'll go, okay, I'll go to Damien. Is there a chance of working as a research fellow, like a paid position, and after a year apply to the MPH? Yes, for sure. Uh, in, like there, definitely, there are many positions around the U.S. Paid positions are difficult to find because you know you're asking someone from the US to trust you and they don't know you, they don't know what your level of knowledge. But if there is a way to make a connection, 
yes, there is definitely a way to make, uh, to get a paid position. In my case, uh, I arrived through the clinical research program to an, an, an unpaid position, but I worked very hard and I wrote a grant with my PI. And since I wrote the grant, she was able to pay me from that grant. Uh, and then I applied for the MPH. So that's definitely a possibility. Uh, Erie doesn't offer that. That's definitely our plan in the future, in the not so near future, because that demands having at least 60K per person. That's $60,000 per person. And, but definitely, you know, there are paid positions everywhere. Uh, I know a person who got a paid position in, in Atlanta, in Emory University, after doing PPCR, uh, and then they apply to the MPH. So there are many options. Now, Erie doesn't offer that, uh, but you can definitely check other labs. Great, thank you for that. Yes, there are many positions um, uh, in, in many states that, where you can apply for this. And then Julia is asking, um, is, why do you re what do you recommend? We already talked a little bit about it, but let's talk about it a little more. Are you doing the residency or, or the MPH first? She's, in a, she's a medical student right now. Okay, uh, Julia, what special do you want? Julia, please open your mic. You're, you're welcome to talk, please. Hi, uh, so, hi, hi. Uh, sorry for that. Actually, I got a bit late in this meeting, so oh, I don't apologize. Worry. Do not worry um, at all. So I, I'm not sure what I want yet because I'm still in the middle of my uh, med school course. Mm -hmm. So basically, I want to focus on the clinical part of medicine. I, I do not want surgery, maybe cardiology. Okay. Okay, so in that case, to be honest, for internal medicine, uh, again, doing the MPH before or after doesn't really impact that much. Uh, the application process, I mean, I don't think you, you, it depends. We've had people, you know, from Erie that have matched into very good uh, internal medicine programs. Uh, one of the alumni actually matched into the Yale uh, medicine program and he didn't do an MPH. He just had a strong application. He had PPCR and he had uh, the ERI program. Uh, and there's people who have had an MPH and match, you know, in Alabama. So great programs both, but again, that will uh, depend a lot on your application and how strong your scores are, your CV. Uh, I mean, and it depends. I, I understand that the main debate is, is the MPH actually gonna help my application? And even though that should be one of the reasons why you do the MPH, I didn't do it for that. I did it because I wanted to do the research and I wanted to be to have the tools to do research for when I got into residency. So um, it, it again, it's a decision that you have to take. Having the MPH, I mean, might get you a better spot. It might not, but it doesn't hurt. Like nobody will say if you have an MPH, it will hurt your application. For sure, it won't hurt, especially if you do the Harvard School of Public Health MPH because of the. And I feel like at least it's not just the MPH. It's you know coming to Boston, getting to do the practicum with an internal medicine doctor in one of the Harvard affiliated hospitals that will write a letter of recommendation for your application for your residency application uh, if you do the work, and definitely will make the calls for you. That's the other thing that actually I forgot to discuss that. I feel like even though the MPH will give you the knowledge, if you position yourself well in terms of, you know, your networking and which doctor you're going to work with, you might, one, get a job after the MPH, and two, get, you know, better interviews because that doctor is going to write a letter of recommendation. That doctor is going to, you know, pick up the phone and be like, hey, like I have this amazing candidate called Julia. Please interview them. And it has happened. I've seen people, you know, uh, one of my best friends here, when she applied to pediatrics, she was doing the ERI program here and her mentor actually sent emails to different programs to, you know, saying, you know, this person is a strong applicant, please give them an interview. And she got interviews because of that. So there's many, many um, levels to why the MPH can help you. It definitely doesn't hurt you, but it can help you. Thank you so much. Great. 
And then we have a question from Hans who's asking, by any chance, do you know if there are, are, are there any cardiovascular labs or chances to work doing research in this field? We Hans do is doing have, right now internal medicine, I believe. We do have yeah. cardiology labs. Mm -hmm. that yeah. we, do, we, we have a lot of cardiology labs. Uh, we have, it's, uh, you can check in the websites at the Dr. Gerzen, G-E-R-Z-E-N, and we have many junior faculty that take people from that lab. So we have at least like three to four spots there. Yes. Okay, great. I will put you in contact with him. Uh, and then um, other question. Um, Paz is asking that um, the applications for ERI are open at the web page. Should we apply just in case they open or? Um, I wasn't aware that they were open because there is a, there is a disclaimer there. So uh, we are delaying the application process. We definitely will put an update in terms of uh, application, but uh, I can definitely double check that with the director and I can tell Alma, I can send you an email about that. And so in case anyone is, uh, wants to apply, uh, one, you can ask Alma for my information and you can feel free to send me an email. Um, you know, people have been doing that and I'm, I'm very responsive, uh, but yeah. So, you know, let me double check with the director. Yes, great, and thank you for doing that and for helping us and the students to get into no, that. We, we've had so many great people coming from PBCR to IRI, to the ERI program, and we're very grateful. I mean, as I told you, I mean, the best example for me is John Polanco, currently at TA2. He, I selected him to come to the lab of Dr. Ken, and he has been doing an amazing job. He, you know, he's on his first year of research fellowship, he already got an oral at the American College of Surgeons Clinical Congress. Amazing. So hard work definitely gets rewarded. Completely agree. Completely agree. And then um, other question was, Manuel, do you think that I should be studying for the step two and doing the MPH? Marcela, do you mean the step two CK, right? To be honest, any of them. I took the CS yeah, uh, because, while, yeah. I was, while I was doing the, the MPH. I actually... Uh, randomly took a bus to Philadelphia to take the, the CS. One day, one Monday, I didn't have any classes at the MPH and then finished the CS and took a bus back to Boston and the next day I was doing my classes. So yes, you can definitely study for both. I've seen many people who have studied for both steps two CS and CK during the MPH. It's better if you don't have to do that during the MPH for sure, but yes, it, it's possible. Yeah, for the CS, some people, is, I, I just study one week, but... Uh, oh, for CS, I studied one day. Yes, you too. <laughs> and then um, something else. Um, yes, because I want to say that um, most of international graduates, we have like a lot of clinical skills. Yes. That's why it's easy for us. And I want to reinforce that to you and not to be afraid of, of that exam at all. The only uh, thing that we uh, foreign medical writers have to learn is just basically the lingo. You know, like it's just what to say. The clinical skills, we all have it. You just have to learn the, I'm sorry to hear that. We're gonna help you today. Uh, you know, my back hurts. I'm sorry to hear that. Let me help you. You know, that lingo is the, it's basically what makes people fail that exam. So if you get the, Kaplan, the not the Kaplan, the, the step to CS, the regular book that everybody gets, uh, first aid, the first aid. <laughs> The first thing for that, you'll be fine. Yes. Great. Other question from Gaiki was, if she can apply to one more, to, to more than one type of MPH at the same time. Last time I checked, no. But definitely make that question when you're trying to apply to that. But last time I, I double checked that, you couldn't. If I took only the BPCR, is that okay to apply to the MPH? What do you recommend to do? Is there a necessity? To do that, yeah, you can definitely just finish PPCR and then apply to the MPH. We have people that have done it for sure. Uh, again, it's a case by case basis, it depends on your application, how strong are your scores, how strong is your personal statement, and your letters of recommendation. But definitely, you we have uh, Pedro Cunha that he did PPCR. I met him at the uh, Brazil workshop last year that I was uh, very fortunate that Felipe invited me as faculty to that workshop. I had, you know, some of you know me from there. I had a great time with all of you. 
and he did an amazing job in the uh, work uh, in the group project. And again, highly recommended by Alma. Mm -hmm. And you know, I, I I wrote a letter of recommendation for him. And you know, in March he told me the great news that he was accepted into the MPH. So well, he didn't do any intermediate steps, uh, and he got in. He just did PPCR. Yes, that's a, a, another option. And we're really proud of those achievements, and we hope that all of you keep growing in that. Um, Paz is asking, what type of visa do we need for the IRI? IRI uh, so it, well, uh, the hospitals sponsor you a J-1 visa. So J-1 visa is the one that usually have the two-year requirement of going back home after that visa. But not every one, not every country has that requirement, and some countries can do a waiver. In my case, for example, I came with a J1 visa, and then I'm currently on an H1B visa sponsored by the Brigham. And even though I had the two year requirement, Peru actually is able to give you a waiver for a J1 research visa. And that's just a paper that I had to do the, you know, the paperwork for. And you know, not right now I'm on an H1B visa. Yes, but yes, J1 visa is the one that I already gives you. Hello? Well, I already doesn't give you the visa. It's the hospital that gives you the visa. Hi, Manuel. Thank you uh, for Hi, your talk. Um, I was wondering if they give us a J1 visa. Uh, do you think we're gonna have trouble with new statements that the White House did to get the visa? So uh, I actually got an email uh, last week from the Partners International Office. And yes, uh, the president signed, uh, signed, signed one bill or however you call it, where there is not going to be any new sponsoring of J-1 visas or H-1B visas unless you are you know, an essential worker, which is, for example, if you're coming from res for residency. Or in terms of research, research is not necessarily an essential situation, but it says that if it's any kind of research related to COVID, uh, it will be exempt from that bill and you can come. But again, this is until December 31st. So we don't know what's going to happen next. I mean, there's first of all, mm -hmm. there is elections this year in the US. So we don't know if Trump's going to still be president for next year. And if he does, he might sign new things. So, you know, even if we at IRI uh, decide to open full and um, to do the application process and for next year uh, we don't know like for example you know, we don't know what's going to happen with COVID we don't know what's going to happen so but that won't stop us from you know the whole application process okay but yes yes I, I mean it depends like for example and uh, the best example is this year we were supposed to have people to the program and unfortunately you know we couldn't because you know there was a higher freeze in most hospitals and even though these are unpaid positions that in, are included within new hires so yes unfortunately we had that situation is there like a different and like um what type of j1 b side is it like the research scholar or yes, yes. so you have okay. j1 clinical which is the one you do or you get when you do residency and that gives you the two-year home requirement and there's no waiver for that or you can do the actual three-year waiver in an in an underrepresented area in the u.s mm -hmm. or you have the j1 research scholar and that again some countries don't have that requirement and some countries offer the you know paper waiver which is okay. what i i got mm -hmm. okay thank you Great, and then Manuel Hadiza from Nigeria. She's a great participant from, from your program too. She's asking if she needs to take the USMLE to apply to IRI. You don't need to take the USMLEs to apply for IRI. If you already took them, it doesn't hurt to, sh to send your, your scores, but no, you don't need to. Great, yes. So that's why it's a great opportunity for medical students to, to come. And, and we've had medical students. Most yeah. of the people, I would say 95% of the people are already MDs, but we have some medical students that have come to IRI, definitely. And they, they went back to medical school to finish it. And then, you know, they set the connections, they did the networking, and then they come back with a paid position. Yes. 
And then um, Karen is asking if she can choose more than one lab specialty for the- For sure, for sure. Like when, when we do the interview, we'll give you, no, actually when you do the application, you can choose, you know, what's your first option, your second option, third option. And in the interview, we'll definitely ask you again. Like for example, like we've had, for example, many people that say I want surgery and I'll be happy with, you know, HPV surgery, but if you have, but like we ask them, you know, are you open for colorectal? Are you open for endocrine or thoracic surgery? And they're like, yes, of course. Or maybe some people are dead set on, you know, colorectal surgery and they don't want any other labs. So you can definitely choose more than one lab and that will help us also place you. I mean, we, what we're trying to do is if you're asking for, you know, GI, uh, we're not going to put you in an ortho surgery lab. So we're, we'll definitely try to match you in the best position for you according to your preferences and again you're offered this position and you know if you have an issue with that you feel free to actually you know tell us that you know you're not okay with the lab and if you would be considered for a second lab now there, there, nothing is forced here you're you can definitely uh, opt out great Yes, and, and they always try to give you the best lab uh, for you according to what you have selected. Yes. And then, um, oh, so basically that's it. There are no more questions now. Some students have to leave because the office hours just started at 5 p.m. Oh, okay, they, okay, saying, okay. they were saying thank you for the great lecture. It was really informative and saying thank you to you for the, all that information. Uh, does anyone else have any questions or want to make um, a live question? You can open your microphone, feel free free. Um, we have a lot of TAs connected, which is great. Thank you for being here. And we know that you also want to follow this path. Um, yeah, yeah, saying thank you to you. And uh, thank you, Manuel, for all the insights. Any final words to them? If there is no... Oh, Pastor, yeah. you want to make a question? I, question yeah. ahead. Yeah, I, I just have a last sure. question. Sure. Uh, when are we going to hear something about the, uh, the ED? When it's going to get... Like, is there like a certain time? So we are on the process on, of evaluating what, what are, what's going to be the plan. Because mm -hmm. again, I think we haven't made a, a decision because things keep changing. I mean, at some point, the US was opening most things. But as you know, the cases of COVID are on the rise again. So we might go back to quarantine. Uh, at least in Massachusetts, we're doing well. But we don't know what's going to happen. So we're, wait, we're, we're being very cautious about that. Definitely any update will be put on the Erie website and you have it there. And again, if you have any questions, you can you feel free to, you know, you can always ask Alma and Alma has always been very good in telling me, in asking me and, well, worst case scenario, you can give my information Alma and they can send me an email. I'm very responsive um, and yes. So, but okay. definitely we'll let, we'll let you guys know. Okay, thank you. Yes, because right now we have to follow the government policies and until that change is that they can move, you know. Yeah. And that is hap happening in the whole country. Many fellows have had to leave. They couldn't uh, renew the visas. Other people couldn't get in as, as, as Manuel explained. We have many current PPCR students who couldn't uh, get in, in place in the IRI labs, in the labs here at Boston um, because of that. But probably that will change soon. And uh, that will depend also on COVID, right? How all the pandemic is going, is the border will open, all that. But yes, and um, yeah, Ruben is telling us about how, like, um, yeah, ECFMG has changed their certification requirements. That's true. There is no longer a CS because of COVID. So just double check what are the new requirements. I took my CS a long time ago, so I'm good. <laughs> yeah, me too. 2012. 2014 here. No, oh, 15. I took it 15. 16, actually. 16. <laughs> yes. Um, yes. So, something else? Any other final comments, Mano, for the, all the students here? Uh, uh, again, yes. again, work hard. Work hard in PPCR. It's a great, great opportunity to be able uh, to participate in this course. It, as I mentioned, provide me a huge, huge solid base to do research and even to do the MPH. You know, I was sitting next to all the Ivy League graduates in the MPH and, you know, I was confident in my knowledge because I had all the stuff I learned in PBCR. Did it give me an extra advantage in terms of the application? Yes, 
I work a lot during PPCR. I actually uh, feel like Felipe remembers me from my 2014 cohort uh, because I was always participating in the graduation. I was the one who gave the speech in PPCR. I unfortunately wasn't able to go to Brazil that year because of visa issues. Uh, but I was finally lucky to go to Brazil last year and get to know all of you. And as I always say, uh, hard work will always be rewarded. And, you know, think a lot about what are your options uh, for your future plans. Uh, there is a way to go into clinical, there is a way to go into research, and there is a way to combine both of them. And, you know, academic centers are, have been liking research for a while and definitely consider those people with publications as stronger candidates. And if you wanna have publications, you have to know how to do research and you have to know statistics. So PPCR is definitely an amazing opportunity in many ways. So take advantage of all the resources and all the tools. Yes, thank you, Manuel. And also Professor Felipe is, is happy to write a letter of recommendation for you. He also mentions that to keep doing the, the hard work so we can, so he can write more details on that letter for you. Okay, so please work hard in the program, keep learning, keep collaborating with your, your group. Now we're beginning the group project phase uh, where you have, to, you have to start writing that protocol and uh, it's a great opportunity for you to apply all that you have learned in model two and model one. So if you don't have any other questions, we will see you next Wednesday with another faculty speaker. And thank you, Manuel, for all your time. I know that you are really busy. <laughs> and we appreciate it. And Professor Felipe also, he, he's sending you his thanks. He's listening to you. He's also in another meeting, but he's also here. Oh, don't worry. No, I, I, I actually have to give thanks to Felipe because I wouldn't be here if it wasn't for him. So definitely appreciate the opportunity PPCR gave me and how it started my career. Great. Thank you, guys. Thank Bye. you very much.